<laughs> but thank you for coming. Uh, this is Ethereum Denver. Um, before we get kicked off, I just want to say thank you to our generous host at Enterprise. Uh, Enter Enterprise has been our home for the past about year and a half, and it's uh, much appreciated. They're super chill here. Um, I know some of you actually work out of here, and it's a cool spot. Thank you very much. Um, thanks also to Shapeshift. Uh, disclaimer, I also work at Shapeshift. Uh, Shapeshift was kind enough to uh, provide some swag. Uh, you're about to hear from that from them shortly. Um, and thank you to Chainlink and our presenter, Delano. Um, so just before we get it, uh, jumping in here, quick show of hands, who's here for the first time at Ethereum Denver? Okay, cool, welcome. Um, Denver has a really good crypto scene. A uh, quick bit of history, Ethereum Denver started about five years ago. Back then there was a really already like a vibrant Bitcoin meetup. Um, we decided to start a Ethereum meetup over this new technology that, you know, who knows if it'll work or not. Turns out it, it sort of did. Things are cool. Um, Denver and Boulder is becoming increasingly like a crypto hub. My, my own vision for, for this, this scene is that someday, you know, you'll have Silicon Valley, but we'll have a crypto mountain right here. And if you, um, I know some people went up to Wyoming. If you look at our neighboring state as well, this is actually working out to be a really vibrant region for crypto. I think it's our Wild West kind of fuck authority ethos combined with, uh, <laughs> I hope nobody here likes authority. <laughs> yeah. Cryptorado, yes. Yeah, we're trying to blow up a hashtag. Crypt, crypt, hashtag Cryptorado. Um, but it's actually turning out uh, to be that uh, in increasingly um, just a, a positive and, and good nourishing space for crypto. There's a lot of businesses here, Salt, Radar Relay, Shapeshift. Um, there's more and more coming all the time. Um, so you're in the right place. Uh, so that said, I'm going to hand it, actually, real quick, somebody had something to say uh, about a, yes. Thank you. Um, so anyway, guys, um, we are starting a blockchain onboarding service. It's called First Contact Crypto, if you haven't heard of it already. We're just now getting to an MVP stage with our website. Um, and on Wednesday, we're doing a pitch competition at uh, Denver Live uh, Foundation. Obviously, I'm not in control of uh, promotions and marketing. <laughs> So we're doing a pitch competition at Founders Live Denver. It's on Sherman Street, 1576 Sherman Street, on Wednesday at 6 p.m. If you guys can possibly make it to vote for us, we get a whole bunch of like credits for computer infrastructure. So if uh, you guys would want to show up and give it a listen and give us a vote, we appreciate it. Thank Do we you. need to be there physically Ooh. to vote for you? Yeah, unfortunately, okay. I guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was going to send my I'm not, I'm not in charge of this kind of stuff, so you'll have to have all the answers. Thank you. So this, uh, this kind of touches on one element of this community. This community is here for you. If you, got, if you ever have anything you're building, uh, anything related to Ethereum or crypto in general, we're definitely not maximalists here. You know, this is a movement. This is a broader movement, broader than any technology. Um, you're always welcome to come and talk about it or give us a heads up and uh, you can present. Um, who is us? That's myself, Kent. Uh, Sasha and Corey are also organizers of Ethereum Denver. Uh, they're not here tonight, but they're awesome. We have Dan as well, who is a tireless advocate of crypto in this space. Tireless. tireless. Keep rocking it, Dan. Um, lastly, before I, I hand it over, um, I just want to do a quick disclaimer. I kind of do this at the start of every meetup, but it's important to keep in mind. Um, some of the technologies we'll talk about tonight, Ethereum, Chainlink, and pretty, a lot of other stuff are investments. Uh, always remember uh, to be very uh, deliberate and cautious in investing in crypto. Uh, this is a high-risk, high-reward environment. Never invest more than you can lose. Uh, be very wary of people on Twitter hyping anything. You know, you see a lot of this. You see this from maximalist. You see that you know, th there's there's way too much of this. Always do your own research. Be skeptical, um, and definitely by all means have fun uh, and invest. And in, but uh, make sure you don't get caught up in, in the hype. Secondarily, uh, always always use a hardware wallet. Um, does everybody know what a hardware wallet is? Okay, cool. Um, if you're if you're if you're trusting Coinbase, yes, Coinbase. They're okay. They seem legit, but you know you never know. Uh, it's, it's essentially kind of a crypto bank, and we're trying to get away from banks. 
more importantly, a hardware wallet is the only way that you can know that you actually have custody of your own keys. Otherwise, you're running a massive risk, um, and it's actually pretty easy to set up. And uh, yes, there's there's more to come on that. I'll, I'll that's that's all I'll say. But yes, uh, invest cautiously, use crypto wallets, and um, yes, have fun. Okay, so uh, just a quick. Uh, so my name is Delano. First off, uh, I'm an ambassador for Chainlink, um, and uh, my real job is a software engineer at Ticketmaster. So uh, just kind of curious who, like, well, like just got to feel the room. How many people in here are developers or software engineers? Um, okay, all right, cool. So maybe a little, little bit, about half, smidge less than half. And then how many people have tried their hand at writing a, an Ethereum uh, smart contract? Okay. Okay, no, that's cool. All right, so. And okay, so cool. Then I think this is going to be a pretty decent presentation for you guys because I'm going to go a little bit more in depth uh, as far as um, some of uh, Chainlink's approach to uh, tackling some of the uh, inherent issues with um, solving this problem they're trying to solve. So the title of the presentation is Connecting Smart Contracts to Off-Chain Data, APIs, and Traditional Payments. But we're going to get a little bit of background about, um, let me check the time here real quick. Uh, we're going get to get, get into the background a little bit about blockchain, what a smart contract is, and then what sort of um, issues might arise and trying to connect that to the real world and how Chainlink aims to solve that. So, okay, cool. So, um, some background that a lot of you might be familiar with is blockchain offers a cryptographically secure method of recording transactions. So really what that means is that um, there's a ledger of transactions, Alice pays Bob, Bob pays Charlie, Charlie pays Alice over time, and it's cryptographically secured by a network of computers rather than a central authority. So an analogy that I've heard recently start to pop up is uh, you can think about it like a game, like maybe a, like a soccer game, and instead of having a referee who calls a penalty, who calls a foul, who keeps score, um, all of the players keep score, they all are able to call fouls and all of that. However, there's a very uh, secure method that has to be enforced for the game to even work. And that's effectively what blockchain offers you, is the ability to have a, uh, a, a, dis a, a way to achieve finality in payments um, over time. And then what uh, Ethereum introduced were the, this concept of smart contracts, which offer a deterministic way of executing um, arbitrary code. So um, the idea here is that uh, you can write some sort of code to the blockchain, issue a token, have its own, it can have its own validation from like, who you can send it to, who can receive it. And so you've seen different applications pop up around that, people issuing, um, you know, uh, unique assets like CryptoKitties or stuff like that, and then obviously some of the tokens out there. Uh, but um, currently, smart contracts are unable to connect with external data on their own, and this is, uh, a, this is an inherent feature of smart contracts. In order to be deterministic, you can't have one particular node uh, responsible for um, getting off-chain off data, and if it's going to be deterministic, you can't have some of the playback be dependent on, uh, you know, what was the closing price of the S&P 500. You can't, you can't do that because it's not, it's not deterministic. So uh, that's sort of part of the, one of the pillars of Ethereum is, you know, it has no features per se, right? So all of these features have to be built on or done off chain. And uh, by Chainlink's estimate, 80% or more of uh, smart contract use cases are going to require some sort of off-chain uh, connectivity. So uh, right now what you have is, uh, I lost my picture, whatever. So blockchain middleware creates connectivity. Um, and basically what Chainlink does is it uh, allows for something called uh, oracles. Chainlink focuses on blockchain middleware. Um, and these oracles are pieces of code. I mean, if you can run Docker, you can run a Chainlink node. And they fetch um, external data so that smart contracts can include real-world events. So 
Um, anything that can receive some sort of uh, connection over the internet, you could probably have a chain link node execute. So um, one of the big features of this is having smart contracts finally um, tap into widely accepted bank payments. So there's the PSD2 standards in Europe, um, which basically say, hey, uh, all of these banks need to start being interoperable, and people need to be able to say, I want to just transact money across banks without having to wait for tons and tons of uh, time for it to reach you know, some, some, some level of finality. So um, that's, that's probably an interesting use case there. Um, and likewise, uh, you can connect different disparate systems via Chainlink. So you can think about so having a Chainlink node, listen to something happen on uh, the uh, Ethereum blockchain, and then firing an event in the real world. So likewise, you want a smart contract to execute from the real world, you can have a smart contract actually uh, for something to happen in the real world with Chainlink. So you end up with end-to-end -end reliability for your smart contracts, and there's a particular uh, approach that Chainlink has in order to um, achieve this. And uh, there's a few tenants, and I kind of added one to the last, if you've seen some of this presentation elsewhere. Um, but the big, big one is decentralization of oracles into oracle networks. Um, and that comes with its own uh, set of challenges, which um, a lot of them have already uh, been addressed, at least um, in some capacity, by the team. Um, and uh, binding commitments by oracles of smart contracts so that uh, oracles have to enter into some sort of an a, uh, an on-chain verifiable agreement where um, there is some sort of uh, uh, skin in the game component to this. Um, and then uh, provable reliability for individual nodes and networks so that you can actually see, um, you know, Bob's node has been able to respond to 95% of jobs that they've uh, said they were going to. All of this is verifiable on-chain. Um, and then uh, defense in depth, uh, which really involves a lot of hardware security. So um, with trusted execution environments, and we'll get into a little bit about like what that looks like and what that is. Um, and then scalability. So this is a big one through threshold signatures. Um, and that's actually, this, that, that's probably one of the more interesting um, things that really come out of Chainlink in the past uh, couple months. So decentralization, how does that, how, what does that look like? What does it mean? Uh, right now, you've got uh, a source of decentralized computation. So you've got your Ethereum blockchain, a bunch of nodes, confirming transactions over time. And then if you wanted to have some sort of off-chain event trigger that, you're dependent, at least currently, unless you're using Chainlink, on a centralized oracle to fetch or interact with your data sources. So what you have is thousands of nodes of computation dependent on one failure point. And if that's taken out, uh, that really undoes a lot of the benefits of having an Ethereum smart contract um, attempt to do something in the real world. So how does Chainlink avoid this? Well, you end up with, instead of one node, you end up with many nodes. So uh, you have a decentralized Oracle network so that you're able to um, have some level of redundancy between uh, your smart contract trying to connect off chain and do something. So an example would be uh, you know, some sort of a shipment gets delivered and you need to remit payment. Well, if you can actually say, uh, hey, when this FedEx package gets scanned, um, I want a Chainlink Oracle to ping that API with, the, um, with whatever information and tell me that it's been delivered and I'm going to go ahead and remit payment. So uh, you can actually aggregate different data sources. So this could come from different shipping data sources, different flight data sources. You could use like Sabre or something like that, which is a massive, I mean, that's like what the back end that powers all of your, um, all of your uh, like Kayak and those kind of websites. And then, you know, you could, you could reach out to different uh, cryptocurrency um, website at, like and aggregators for price and then do something based on that and have off-chain payments. So there's no reason like a chain link Oracle couldn't, um, you can delegate authority to that to make, a, make some sort of a, a Bitcoin payment um, or make some sort of payment uh, via Swift or on PayPal or anything like that. Uh, so currently that works through something called external adapters. And what those are, basically anything written in any language that can communicate to a cha chain link node via JSON. So as long as it can actually compete, talk to it with your typical um, you know, web stack kind of communication, you can uh, have it execute 
stuff in the real world. So there's a ton of this already like baked in. Like if you run a chain link node today, you get like HTTP post, you get like um, a bunch of different little computation things that can, you know, you can actually start processing fairly interesting con uh, use cases today. Uh, so a quick overview of the architecture. And this is a really simplified view, but I like this because effectively what it shows is um, where you've got your blockchain, where you've got Chainlink, and where you've got your external adapters, and where you've got your external data. So really, the Chainlink node communicates to external adapters, um, which fetch external data, and that brings it to the Chainlink node. The Chainlink node can also fetch external data if it's like a public API or something like that without having to go through some sort of external adapter. Um, and then back to your blockchain node. So. Uh, that kind of brings up like, okay, I've built a smart contract and I trust that, uh, how do I trust that these nodes are going to do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it? And if they don't, what happens? So that brings in the concept of staking or a little bit more um, specific is this idea of binding commitments. So you've got a service agreement uh, between the Oracle and the contract. So you've got the uh, chain link contract sitting there. You got a service agreement in order for them to actually interact with that and in order to actually service that um, Smart contract they have to put up some level of collateral in the form of link tokens um, And both the commitment and performance are verifiable on chain so you can tell that uh, when this contract was written and It selected this Oracle contract. These were the nodes that and they're and they're corresponding Ethereum addresses that said they were going to respond to it, and then here's what actually happened over time. So, uh, you what can happen too is because they have to put some sort of collateral up, they can be a penalty payment as well. So they fail to respond, they lose their money, okay, um, or some fact, some some level of money, right? So it might not be all, it might be ten percent, might be five percent, might be something, but there has to be a certain level of of commitment there. So oracles with deviating responses can be punished and have an economic loss of token. Uh, yeah, so, th so really what you've got here is um, a future uh, set of downside risk for these uh, oracles. If you fail to respond to jobs and the network's getting traction, you're not gonna be selected to do jobs in the future. At least with that particular node, that particular um, Ethereum address and everything else. And, um, the nodes are relatively simple to set up, but they're not like, I mean, they're not like a, they're not like a cakewalk. Um, and then that basically brings us to provable reliability. So uh, in order to establish this framework, we have to kind of think about like, what is, a, what is a civil attack? And basically that's, all right, so now I can kind of trust that there's some, there's some downside risk if you don't give me the data I need. Um, but how do I know all of those individuals running those nodes are not the same person? Right, so if you have a large value contract and you're writing it, you want to be assured that you're using independent uh, node operators uh, to feed that data back on chain. And then, so what you want is you want verifiable performance. That kind of happens through your uh, binding commitments. And then what we have now is independent listing services. You can actually, Chainlink is actually running their own listing service now where you know, there's a various level of, of, of independence. So what it boils down to is how much decentralization do you need? And nobody really knows the, the answer to that question, right? Like it's, it's it, the answer to how much decentralization you need is how much decentralization do you feel you need, right? How, how valuable is this co particular contract? Is it, you know, 10 nodes, 30, 100? You can pretty much uh, figure out that based on kind of like what maybe your gas costs are and what, like how expensive things are. So. What right now there's an independent listing service, uh, or there's, there's some independent listing services. There's Linkpool.io, which you, which has a node listing uh, marketplace, and there's Chainlink Consulting Group's Notary, N O D A R Y, and there's already people spinning up nodes um, and waiting for like contracts to get you know through audit and select them for jobs. Uh, and this is really one of those things that's kind of we'll leave it up to the community and figure and they can kind of figure out how they want to do this. But there's an obvious um, kind of uh, impetus on node operators, to be honest, through binding commitments. So, uh, defense in depth, this really boils down to, uh, you know, kind of your hardware security model and how do you obfuscate the data that 
you're putting on chain so you can uh, be somewhat ensured that you know nobody's going to be able to find out what that data really means. And a big one of these is using trusted execution environments. The, the dominant one today is Intel SGX. So on all their modern uh, Intel processors, there's a secure enclave. And what that does is it uh, reduces the attack surface area. So traditionally, like today, you can get to the application, you can get to the OS, and then if you can do that, you can get to the hardware, and you can sort of you know, figure out what's happening with the machine. What Intel SGX does is it says, okay, here's a part of the hardware that even the OS or the user can't access. Now, there is a little bit of, there are some concerns, it's still early days for this technology. If somebody has direct access to the hardware, they might be able to do some stuff, but um, with, with a cloud service provider like Azure on their DC instances, you can run an SG, you can run, um, you can run a chain link node with, um, on a machine that will be SGX enabled. So, um, you know, so where do you want to, where do you want to put that, that level of trust? And um, then you've reduced the attack surface area dramatically. If somebody has access to the application, they're not going to have access to what the hardware is encrypting and decrypting. So last year, Chainlink bought an implementation of this um, called Town Crier, which was built by um, Ari Jules and some of the folks at Cornell. And what it does is it basically gives this a way to interact with a lot of common libraries. So you can like offload your computations for uh, stuff like random, uh, random, random number generators, that kind of thing, which would be super expensive to run that kind of stuff on chain. And you probably wouldn't even get a very random number. So um, you can also kind of reinforce some level of confidentiality for your payments. You would basically take the uh, the public keys for those SGX pieces of hardware, use that to encrypt the data, then you might be able to put, then you put that on chain and you, and it would only be able to be decrypted by those particular SGX machines. So if you assume that your SGX machines aren't compromised, then you could be relatively confident that you could put some information on there that is relatively, uh, that you would want some, some, some degree of privacy. So that's, that's pretty much what it offers. There is control of private keys for use by a smart contract. And there's a ton of well-tested libraries. Um, so really all it is is a, so this is kind of an architecture diagram of how it works. You just got the chain link node calling some, uh, some library and then it doesn't actually uh, know what's happening inside that enclave, but it can still return that value to the smart contract. So this is the best name. Uh, mixicals, which is <laughs> uh, mixer plus oracles uh, equals mixicals, and what these are is you know this is a this is a privacy thing. So you've got uh, big financial uh, institutions which that want to uh, transact with one another, but they don't want to let the entire world know on a publicly accessible blockchain who those payments are going to. So uh, what you have is a chainlink oracle triggering basically like some kind of a switch statement into a smart contract uh, to send a payment based on an off-chain agreement. So you decide on the uh, terms of the agreement before entering into this, and then you can do this. And this is a very simple example, but uh, here you've got your Chainlink Oracle, here you've got your smart contract, and here you've got Alice and Bob with their off-chain identities putting some unit, one unit of a dollar into this oracle. And then based on some real world event, uh, it pays out to whatever their pseudonymous address is. So uh, obviously the bigger, uh, the more, more um, participants you have in one of these, the better obfuscated uh, your, your payment address, your payment, um, you know, the better, the better uh, pseudonymous protection you kind of have uh, between your real identity and your paying address. So, you know, if anybody's used kind of a, a mixer before, this is a similar concept, but it's being instantiated by a Chainlink Oracle rather than some level of randomness. And a big, big thing with this is scalability. So, um, I mean, if you were here in late 2017, you know, like, what CryptoKitties, um, what kind of enthusiasm that brought to the network. So, uh, 
what, 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 what Chainlink has to address this are, are threshold signatures. And if anybody's familiar with like uh, Schnorr signatures, it uses um, that type of, uh, of encryption to, to accomplish this. Um, I'm not gonna pretend to understand this uh, level of mathematics behind this, but you can actually see um, a lot of the development for the code working on this um, um, in the repo like today. So there, there is serious progress being made to this. Um, so it offers, it's scalable across many nodes. It gives a cheap to construct signature. Um, and what that basically means is like, say you have some highly decentralized, some high value contract with, th that you would like a high degree of certainty that you have um, a ton of uh, oracles grabbing that external data. So if you have like 1,500 um, oracles grabbing that data, it's gonna be really, really expensive to put all of that back on chain. Like, I mean, it would just, like, it'd be astronomical. And then imagine if you have a CryptoKitty scenario, just what that would do to the network, right? So what we wanna do with uh, threshold signatures is we basically wanna let the oracles communicate, and then once a sufficient number of them have, the, have retrieved the data, they can uh, provide a unique signature based on just a subset of those oracles. So right now, maybe if you have a smart contract that needs to execute and you want, you say, okay, I have 2,000 nodes that are gonna reply back to it, and it's good enough when 1,500 reply back, right? You might do something like that, so you don't have one node that's a holdout preventing your contract from executing. Well, this is a similar concept, but let's say once a sufficiently large subset of the total nodes has an answer, they can construct a unique signature and one node can reply. Now, the mechanics of that I'm not too familiar with, but I think like some of the stuff being floated around is like just let them race and figure out like, which one everyone can write back to the smart contract and get the state change first. That would be who wins. So, like in this example, you basically have a 1500X cost in savings. So, um, it does not, it, 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 it's, uh, um, it doesn't scale like linearly. So it's, it's, it's very, very exponential how much, uh, how much more you can save. So you can actually choose to have several um, thousands of nodes get this information and you will get a unique signature written back to the blockchain. So you have like a large observation set, something that benefits from having a ton of observers. Um, this is where this stuff gets really useful. Uh, so I'm gonna wrap up a little bit now, but there's a, but um, uh, like as a quick recap, You've got your defense in depth, you've got Intel SGX, they've got support for that at the actual hardware level. Um, and then you've got this concept of using many nodes to uh, execute something on chain and maybe many nodes to do something off chain as well. So, I mean, these nodes can reach out into the real world um, and they can uh, take real data and return it back to the smart contract. One of the innovations there that I wanna talk about real quick is uh, this idea of transfer and call. So the Ethereum improvement proposal 667, I believe, uh, brought about the idea of transfer and call, which says I can transfer it, uh, an asset, in this case the Chainlink token, so it's sort of unique to the Chainlink token. Um, I, can trans I can transfer that to a smart contract, and in the same execution it can call a function. Before, you had to transact and then call the function. So you had to have two transactions to do that and this, and um, part of the, like this is baked into the token from the very beginning. Uh, and the Chainlink node is listening to an Ethereum node to, so, you, so in order to run a Chainlink node you have to be running both an Ethereum node or something like Infura or, God, what are the other ones? Yeah, and then there's, a, there's, there's one uh, kind of focused on Chainlink Fuse F I E W S dot I O, and they, they run they run Ethereum nodes because I mean like if you're gonna run a full Ethereum node to have this thing be super reliable that uses a I mean it's a ton of resources but you can actually hook into something like that a service like that and then just focus on running your uh, Chainlink node in a Docker container. So um, again, trust execution environments providing additional layer of security. Um, wow, lame, I didn't connect to the internet. Um, hold on, real quick, I actually do wanna show you guys this. I'm just gonna use my phone here.
So this is an actual uh, real real implementation of chain link today. Hold on. I'll actually, since I think this, I don't think you guys care too much, I'll just pull, uh, if I have to just pull this up in a web browser. No, come on. Okay, now let's do this. All right, sweet, I think it's gonna load. There we go, okay. So what you, got, what you have here is you have a smart contract that all it does right now is it just says, here's the current price of Ethereum, okay? Don't cry. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and it is using all of these different uh, alias chain link nodes here to basically query the price of it via some external adapter and then write it back to the smart contract. So if you, say you, you had a decentralized finance application that does something really super simple, like I want 10% of my salary in Ethereum, right? Okay, I'm gonna run payroll and I'm gonna say at about midnight on you know uh, the second and last Friday of every month or whatever, I'm gonna pay you, right? Uh, how might that work? Well, you could use the smart contract, grab the current price of Ethereum, and then have some sort of another chain link node listening to it and saying, okay, I'm gonna buy this much of chain link, I'm gonna buy this much of Ethereum, and you know, with this percentage of their salary and dump it into their, uh, dump it into some address, right? So I mean, just stuff like this is pretty useful for, for that kind of thing, um, especially if you're going to use some US dollar, uh, you know, pegged asset, uh, like, like, like Ethereum, in sort of that, uh, that, that, uh, that application. So uh, again, reliable inputs and outputs are really kind of the key building blocks for interesting smart contracts that can do things in the real world that I think maybe all of us are sort of interested in. Um, but so there's your documentation page, docs.chain.link, and Chainlink is hiring. They're hiring a ton of integration engineers. I think they've grown the team to like 25 plus people now. Um, and you know, they're, mo they're all remote, so it's a global company, uh, and, you know, they need integration engineers, they need, um, I think maybe some evangelist and some other, some other roles as well, so. Um, yeah, there is actually, so um, I think if you just go like type in Git GitHub chain link, you can see the repo, and then there's also a Pivotal tracker that's public, so you can see what's being worked on and by whom. Um, you can even say, like sign up and say like, hey, I wanna try, do you guys have anything like minor for me to like work on. Um, and the nodes are written in, if you're, anybody's curious, the nodes are written in, uh, the node code is written in Go, the front end UX is written in React and TypeScript, uh, and obviously all the smart contract stuff is Solidity. So uh, please take a t-shirt, uh, and if you didn't get a t-shirt in your size, there's another one of these happening with Market Protocol, uh, same place, same time, different day, next Wednesday, uh, and Market Protocol is a decentralized finance uh, product, so they do like stuff with derivatives and that kind of thing, and all of that's chain linked. So you can actually see, like, this is what's being built and worked on by other companies today. So I'm, I'm, I'm here if you guys have any questions. Um, um, so can you um, speak to possibly any, <clears throat> with the mechanism that you're using, speak to any constraints or technical challenges that you guys are currently working on? Yeah, so I mean like right now, the product is actually is deployed to mainnet, and what's, and what's being worked on now are the additional contracts for finding commitments or staking, um, and threshold signatures. So, but, you, but if you're curious about like, so, if you're, curious about if you're curious about that, you can actually see some of the code for threshold signatures being worked on in the repository today. So um, this stuff is actually being built like right now. Uh, and um, that example that I showed was a mainnet application. Okay, so you're mainnet, but you're still working on solutions. Yes, yes, so exactly. Thank you. Um, so who, who's a node operator? Sounds like you're going to need to have thousands of node operators, and at that point, are you dealing with some sort of geographic consensus among 
operators? Are we talking like regions or? Yeah, I mean, I don't really think regions would have too much of an implication in there. I mean, obviously, you might have some like latency issues, but you know, I don't know if your contracts are really high frequency enough that you're right now to, for that to be a, an, an impact. But um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So, yeah. but like, are you a node operator, or is like someone who's approved by consensus a node operator? Anybody can be a node operator. And what's the incentive mechanism? So if you want to be a node, so you get paid in chain link. So uh, when a, uh, when you pick up a job or when you put up collateral, um, the collateral is in chain link, the reward is in chain link, the chain link token actually gets transferred to instantiate or to do some sort of state change that kicks off uh, a job. So the nodes are listening to chain link uh, based smart contracts and then that actual transferring call uh, to say do this function. And since this is running the like Ethereum network, at what point does gas need to be used? So gas needs to be used whenever um, the contract is written to. So if you were to say, okay, um, here's this contract that's going to um, initialize some sort of thing, some sort of function, um, then you use gas to transmit the token to that contract and the node to pick up on it. And then the writing back to the contract by the node, which has its own Ethereum address, because it's got a Ethereum node and it's got a chain link node, which has, which actually has an Ethereum address. Um, then it has to be, you have to have uh, Ethereum and chain link. Um, well, you don't really have to have a chain link, you're just not servicing jobs. But you need Ethereum, some level, some amount of Ethereum for gas right back to the smart contract. And obviously, like, so to kind of talk about threshold signatures, not, have, not needing every single node to write back to, um, like, an aggregation contract, for instance, or, or, or back to the uh, smart contract and then that having to do some sort of aggregation process. Sure, but then how are you ensuring the node has gas to send? So a person's that? running the node and they just literally f uh, fund their Ethereum address on their node with gas. And if they don't? Then it would fail right back and you probably have an issue with um, maybe your binding commitment mm -hmm. and you would be able to withdraw some amount of chain link out of, uh, based on the penalty. In there. Does Chainlink have a minimum number of oracles that allow to associate with Chainlink, or is two the minimum? Can you? I think you can use uh, uh, one or nine. Okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. Wait, wait, question. So, say uh, I have a smart contract, and I'm, you know, maybe I'm running on Chainlink node, and I want to connect to a couple oracles, maybe I just want to price information. How, how does that work in, in terms of the binding commitments? What's the failure case? So, if they don't respond in a certain amount of time, obviously that would be one case where you, they lose their stake for some percentage. Right. If they, uh, how is the veracity check? Is that just by the smart contract? The so the accuracy of the data, right? Yeah, like, the uh, so, so, uh, so, is there like a reputation system? In, yeah, in yeah. So, like the rec so, so, we can, so the reputation system would probably just be built. So, I don't know what Chandler's thinking about for reputation. They might write something um, themselves, but I believe the current plan is to let the community deal with the reputation part of that. So the second part of your question, um, and you can, and so you can, uh, you could, you can imagine a scenario where you're just checking to see, like, okay, what percentage of, of commitments that they uh, said they were going to go, they were going to respond back to, that they actually do. So that's like one component. And then um, first part of your question. Uh, like kind of basically what the veracity of the data is, yeah. like the accuracy of the data. Yeah. So uh, if you have several chain link nodes responding back, mm -hmm. um, you're gonna know uh, which nodes uh, provide answers that deviate too far from like the mean, right? So really it's a smart so it's up to yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So it's, it's basically okay. yeah. So it's up to kind of them. Like so, yeah. there's some. And you can you can go into the you can go into the repo now and actually look at some of the aggregation stuff that's there. Like simple like min max like sure. mean stuff. Um, but uh, calculating all that stuff on chain is pretty kind of expensive. So um, again, that's like sort of why you want to have some of the threshold signatures where these oracles are able to say, okay, what's this, and who responded with everything, and what's the signature for that, and then one is writes back. So I wonder specifically about like um, games, a games uh, scenario where you might not fully, obviously, wouldn't necessarily fully trust the oracles you're choosing to connect with. Right? Can the game gain it? In terms of like they're gonna you know it, it, where the you can check that you know you're getting back maybe is within a range is acceptable but maybe it's being maliciously you know the data is coming back it's 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 you know maybe it's a bias and they're trying to like right right just like, like they're, they're trying to boost it in like a certain direction yeah, right, yeah. you just have to handle on the smart contract 
side. Yeah, so that's something you have to handle on the on the smart contract. And then, uh -huh. so really, a lot of this boils down to like how do we make um, the execution like sort of the nuts and bolts of, of contracts like uh, more reliable, more autonomous. Yeah. Um, you know, you're still gonna. This doesn't this doesn't necessarily do away with lawyers or get rid of like contract law. Yeah. And you know, uh, but it does help like say, okay, I need to get all this data, and then we need to get you know, some sort of payment, and it just needs to go, right? So this is how we take advantage of, of code, right, that cannot be stopped to do things in the real world that cannot be stopped and have some um, uh, level of assuredness and tamper-proofness, so. Very cool. Yeah. What happens if there's like a large like cloud provider outage that most of the oracles rely yeah. on? Yeah, so that would suck, right? <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, like, I mean, people are running their nodes on Azure, they're running their nodes on like, AWS. Yeah, not, not from the nodes. Right. Like, the actual oracles are talking to, say, like a third party financial or something. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So what happens if you, oh, so like, you don't want all of them to be penalized, right? Because of, you know, you want some Bloomberg terminal information and, you know, your $20,000 terminal uh, license just happens to be down like that that day, right? Like, that would suck. So, uh, well, what you would do in that instance is they would all be returning the same response. So there would be no mean deviation, right? So in that kind of instance, you probably, you know, you would say, oh, wow, they all return the same answer. Cool, here's your, here's your chain link, right? Like, they would be able to withdraw their reward and, and whatever and not have a penalty, not have a, not have any other penalty payments or something like that. So that's kind of how I would imagine uh, that would work. So, yeah, I mean, some of those details are still being ironed out, but um, I don't see that being like, uh, Impediment to like adoption. So, is that it? No. Okay. So there was an external connector between a chain link node and the external data. Right. What? What? Well, what so it could be anything, right? So as long as um, so as long as something can return back to the chain link node in a way that it can uh, interface with just, just straight up JSON, right? Then it can then the chain link node can say. Um, this is the data for this data source. I'm going to do whatever processing needs to be done and return the answer on chain. So some of this stuff is baked into the chain link node. Like there's some adapters already like come out of the box. Okay. Like your HTTP get. Like just really simple, basic RESTful stuff, right? And there's some other stuff that does some like um, some some math off chain, some aggregation, some min max, that kind of stuff. So you could trust like each chain link node to kind of do their own right. kind of calculation there. Uh, but if you need um, functionality beyond that, then you're talking about external adapters, which could be, you know, uh, some sort of like uh, serverless application, like let's just be a Lambda, right, running on AWS um, that just gives back the node something that I can I can understand. What would one go running on these nodes and like course involvement? Okay, so um, I, yeah, the. I've seen people get away with like uh, running something like just above like the AWS like free tier, right? And then using like Ethereum. So you don't actually have to run a full Ethereum node along with it for it to listen to. Um, you know, the cost is obviously going to be like somewhat uh, data provider specific, but people are running them on Oracle Cloud, Google Cloud, Azure, AWS. I mean, like every single one of people is pretty much on Like, I mean, like Azure for like a DC2 instance, like the, the you know, an SGX enabled. Um, real stuff, like if you wanted, yes, to run the this. whole thing is like 200 plus bucks a month, I think, like in that ballpark. And then, you know, obviously still way, like, comparatively cheaper than mine, right? So, what, uh, is it documentation how it's set up? Is it yes, there is, so on the uh, docs.chain.link, there is, a, the, the documentation is actually pretty good. Like, I'd say it's better than most, like, enterprise companies. So that's another interesting thing, too. Like, you know, you can sell a company the upside of, of you know smart contracts and okay here's how we're gonna get it to work and here's how everything's gonna work end to end and it works with your existing systems but now you have some extra level of assuredness in its execution mm -hmm. you know you're gonna get companies excited but they're gonna say I don't know how to write a smart contract I don't know how to do this I don't know how to do this other thing so that's where like chain integration engineers come in they're kind of dock booting their way out of this and saying like okay this is like the early days of SAP or Salesforce or like even like Microsoft where it's okay we have a service we have something that we're able to provide. Now we have to build it, and we have to like figure out a way to like, monetize it. So, sure, with the early developments, you know, run a chip node on your own hardware. You definitely need the Intel chip of SCX to 
So you get the SGX, yeah, you get like the, 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 the SGX like sound card functionality. Yeah. And lab, I don't remember if the SGX stuff has been um, rolled out into the current node software, but see, that's kind of the cool thing. Like once the once all the contract functionality is built and audited and in yeah. place, you know, the functionality of the nodes can keep growing um, because it's just, you know, it's a Go application that runs in Docker. So with, uh, with like a Postgres uh, database. What kind of uh, improvements have you seen in retrieval time of external data? <sighs> like so, uh, like what kind of like response time is typical for like a node? Like for it to just say like, hey, I need to get this. Like I mean, it's, it's like running a, it's like running a sh just like a, any kind of like uh, uh, that's the service like an express or something. So it's, it's pretty it's pretty standard for like just running a quick like web query from your own machine. Like I mean, it's it's, it's pretty it's pretty good. Uh, this is more of like a tokenomics question, but can you speak about like uh, the difference between the circulating supply of Chainlink and then the, the Tor supply, and how much of that is for staking or? Yeah, so I mean, I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers off off the end, but like I mean, the people just switch up because like there's the and tokens, and then yeah. some I think similar amount was reserved for future development, and I have no idea like what the terms are for any of Chainlink's. Yeah. Uh, like raising the capital or anything like that, or, 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 or how they've gone about doing that. Google question. Okay. <laughs> no, I was saying that was a Google question. Oh, yeah. Do <laughs> you see one of the more value propositions initially for like um, arbitrage? As opposed oh, yeah. to like traditional arbitrage? And like how fast, like, do you think it would take longer? Uh, I think it would be, I think, I mean, Right, like your your theory of blockchain is like relatively slow, really slow, right? And it's going to ultimately be like sort of throttled by like how fast that can go. So, you know, uh, six second block times with Ethereum 2.0 should be cool, but right, that's a long, that's a ways away, right? Have you thought about running smart contracts on different blockchains? Yeah, so uh, I believe the plan currently is. Any block, any like um, platform, like chain that can support the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, they, you know, there, there have been some ideas kind of tossed around, uh, but it's like it is super early days, right? To right. Think about that, but that's yeah, that is the idea is to say like, you know, um, I don't know, like they've already announced partnerships with like Adara, like you know, obviously they have the big ones with Oracle and Google, but the chain ones with like Web three and uh, uh, like Adara. You know, if those were to gain some level of popularity, I think that it'd be yeah, yeah. And then so like, you wouldn't you wouldn't like, necessarily increase the number of tokens, just make like a whole another amount of tokens. But instead, you would do is you would have some sort of way to like lock them on one chain and then lock them in the other chain, so that um, you know the supply stays relatively fixed. Mm -hmm. How about using Chainlink in a layer two context? Let's say I have a Dex and I'm using maybe like Starkware or Plasma as an off chain for layer two, right? Uh, and I want to use Chainlink. Is it as simple as just querying the main chain, or are there extra considerations if you're using chain in the layer two context? Yeah, so I mean, um, that's a really great question. So I'm going to point you to like join our Discord. I can send you the, the link, but like the actual team can reach out, like if you're interested in doing this, like a change up, and, and, and they can fill you in all of this, all of the super technical details. Um, but there are uh, like taxes and stuff that are planning on chain link to do like price feeds and stuff like that anyway. um, and, and in, in, a fair, in a really super autonomous way. So it sounds like that this is baked in natively to Ethereum. So when I'm seeing Bitcoin on here as uh, part of a building block, is that a third party provider that's, that's tying into chain link? Or so, is the chain link node actually, is it able to actually interact with the Bitcoin smart contract? Uh, Blockchain. Yeah, so they, a chain link node could, in theory, um, interact with the Bitcoin network by just, um, cool. s like, just making a transaction to it, basically saying like. So I think there's like some interesting, like, yeah, like they have a wrapped BTC on like Ethereum. Yeah, so um, maybe a similar concept there, but the node itself would just say, Hyperledger do this or Bitcoin do this, right? So you would, and that would be obviously instantiated from some state change on your big smart contract. So, uh, can you foresee like being able to use Viper for Ethereum and then like scripting and scripting? Oh yeah, like so. I mean, like 
Right, Viper just like basically is just another way of interfacing with the email. Yeah. Um, so like, like you could, I mean, you could write a smart contract in Viper, and then I don't see why you could do that now. I don't see. Yeah, I mean, I don't see why you couldn't write a Viper smart contract. I don't. I'm not like I've written the smart contract a little bit, but I don't see why you couldn't write a Viper smart contract that you could deploy to Ethereum and blockchain to interact with and with oracles. And then script and Miniscript on Bitcoin. So I don't know about that. That is a damn good question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Were there staking? I don't know if you mentioned earlier staking rewards for on the chain of chain of nodes. What's that? Was it staking rewards or anything like that for one of these? Oh, nodes? so like what are the staking rewards? So like there. So right now, like the only rewards you're going to get are in the form of uh, link paid out to the Oracle contract to have your node do work um, on main. And I, but. Um, Right now, work toward binding, the, adding the, the, the you know, service agreement contracts for binding commitments, taking are in progress. I mean, the deposit contracts there, I think, to work for penalty payments, like, like I don't know, called safe harbor or whatever, but like, should be getting started soon. But you can go to the repository and see kind of where it's at. And I mean, it's insane, like, how the team has been just hammering out commits. Like, it's, it's crazy. Uh. Are there any other blockchain um, platforms that are thinking about adopting Chainlink or the Chainlink parents? Uh, no. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what they'll, they'll do next. But like, you know, like there's uh, like the Taco Hedera one, what the Web3 Polkadot one. Um, uh, you know, ETH killers. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like, okay, uh, the token could I guess be paid to run on you. Can be made to run any EVM compatible blockchain. So. All right. <laughs> Thank you.